So thanks everyone for coming. Um, Libby is going to start us off by talking about the food that we prepared um, very generously. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of land grant universities and provide some context uh, for holding an event like this at Penn State. Um, and then we're going to do a series of uh, quick highlights of Native American scientists and engineers. Welcome, everybody. Um, and if those of you who are paying attention, you'll notice that we actually missed Native American Heritage Month was last month, but um, because we had MRS the last week and it was Thanksgiving, it, things got a little tight and we weren't able to schedule, but we figured it was fine to celebrate any time of the year, so we moved it to this week. Um, so we're going to talk, um, that you saw the, the outline of the presentation, we thought we'd talk a little bit more about some cultural and kind of historical things in addition to just um, discussing scientists and engineers. So the soup that you're eating, um, those of you that are here is called Three Sisters Soup. And the Three Sisters came out of um, the Native American creation myth that um, started with, I'm not even gonna pronounce Haudenosaunee, I think, um, or Iroquois people. And the, the uh, legend is that Sky Woman fell through a hole in the sky towards the end of endless sea that was the earth. So she was in the upper world. She looked down at the earth and fell through the hole towards the earth. So the animals that were um, in, in the sea brought soil from the bottom of the sea and spread it on the back of a giant turtle. And that became a safe landing place for Sky Woman. Um, that, Turtle became known as Turtle Island, and the, the um, legend is that this is what North America is, and this is where the, the indigenous people live. Um, Sky Woman gave birth to a daughter when she landed, um, and she later gave birth to twin sons. Um, when her daughter died, she buried her in what was called the New Earth on the back of the turtle, and from the site where she was buried, three sacred plants sprouted, and those were foreign beans and squash. And these became very important to the, the indigenous um, tribes. And we'll talk about why that is. Next slide. So um, there's something called polyculture. And this is where these three crops are planted together. And for many reasons, um, these three crops really became the core of the survival for indigenous tribes in the US. Um, the beans produce nitrogen or fertilizer to feed the corn and the squash. The corn stalks give the, the, the beans a natural trellis to climb. And in turn, the bean plants then stabilize the corn, which is, has shallow roots and is prone to being blown over during heavy winds. Um, and then the squash plants spread out along the soil and they prevent weeds from growing. They help keep moisture in because it can't evaporate from the soil. And also because they're kind of spiny, it discourages some of the animals that might come in um, and, and eat the crops. Um, so the, the, the schematic up on the top there shows how you plant this. And essentially you just plant these in a circle. You have the corn in the middle, the beans, and then the squash just kind of covers everything. So very efficient use of space. And as, it, as you can see, the, the plants really um, help each other out in this, this way. Um, so in terms of nutrition, the sisters are also very complementary in that you get carbohydrates from corn, beans um, provide protein, amino acids, and fibers. The whole um, the triad together gives you complete protein, so you don't necessarily need meat if you don't have it. Um, and in addition, all of these crops are easy to store for the long term. You can dry them, the squash is obviously, winter squash is, stores very nicely anyway. Um, so this is the reason that these crops became extremely important and really um, ensured the survival of the, the native tribes. Uh, so these are some resources um, for that I brought that got this information from. If you're interested in the soup recipe, um, I have the link here. Um, it, there are a lot of recipes for this online. I was amazed and they all use different kinds of beans. They use summer squash, winter squash, but I thought this one sounded the most interesting, the best to me. So that's why, why you did that one. But what really impressed me when doing this research and also um, reading Braiding Sweetgrass, which Victoria will talk about a little bit, um, is that th this indigenous knowledge really 
when you look at that compared to what our current um, scientific understanding of polyculture and nutrition is, it's really exceptionally, fits in exceptionally well that what the, the over time, the, the culture developed really makes a lot of sense scientifically. So it's not that, you know, we have this, this creation myth, um, but when you look at, at what the three sisters are and what it represents, um, it, it fits in extremely well, both culturally and scientifically. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, so <clears throat> we thought it was important to talk a little bit about um, the land grant, the history of land grant institutions in the US. Um, and thanks to both Enrique and Victoria for pointing us in this direction. Um, so Penn State has this uh, statement um, about basically the Penn State University campuses being located on original homelands of various tribes that are listed here. Um, and the statement about basically um, as a land grant institution, acknowledging and honoring the traditional caretakers. Um, and so I think I wanted to talk a little bit about what that means, um, the history of the land grant institution. Um, and so I was reading this New York Times article called Native Americans Paid for Americans Land Grant Universities. Um, and I really didn't know the history of this other than you know, the, the idea that the federal government granted um, lands to certain universities uh, in the 1800s. So turns out it's not a good story. Um, basically after the Civil War, uh, Congress uh, granted a bunch of land, um, looks like, yeah, 11 million acres um, to a collection of universities, agriculture and mechanical colleges, which Penn State started as an agricultural college. So we were one of the beneficiaries. Um, but basically the land that this, the federal government granted was you know, stolen um, or in many cases, uh, you know, purchased at very low value with sort of the threat of violence being implied. Um, and so uh, we, you know, we kind of need to reframe our thinking from this being like free land that was given by the federal government to more like that it was uh, stolen and there's kind of a debt that, that was never paid. Um, and so specifically with Penn State in mind, Penn State was one of the largest beneficiaries um, of this, this land grant. Um, with 776,000 acres um, being, being granted by the federal government. Um, and what's really interesting, if you look at this map um, that connects uh, Penn State at the red dot there, and then it's connecting us to all the places that uh, land was granted from. What's really wild is that not only you know, is Penn State on geographically located somewhere where there used to be native peoples, but this land grant um, by the federal government basically gave Penn State land in other places, right? And so in you know Kansas and California and like Wisconsin and other places that have nothing to do with uh, Penn State geographically, um, land was basically stolen from Native peoples in order to pay uh, basically for part of the endowment of the university. And so it was um, inflation adjusted about $8 million uh, worth of land. Um, and here are some uh, numbers. This website, uh, landgrabu.org, has a really great um, comprehensive look at all of these seizures, uh, you know, where they were, um, who was involved in that, and then uh, how much money was basically raised by those, by the sale of those. And so I highlight a couple of things here. So you see that there's this column that says like US paid $203. Um, for this 195 acres in Wisconsin. And then they sold the land for uh, $1,957. And so this is clear that, you know, it was effectively stolen. You know, they, they paid some nominal rate for it and then immediately turned around and sold it for 10 times the value, right? So it's, it's clearly, um, you know, seizing the land effectively. Um, and something that was really crazy to me is this uh, 776,000 acres um, for only like for only $8 million in today's money, right? It really is not that much money compared to like the violence that was done um, to, to achieve that. So that was pretty mind blowing to me. 
Um, and then the other thing that I had highlighted there is this is like one through 10 of 5,326 seizures that benefited Penn State. Um, this is only for Penn State. Um, okay, so then there was this other article that I read. Um, I was talking about this. And of course, they ended the article with kind of what, what can be done about this or what should be done about this. Um, many of the land grant universities, Penn State included, have this acknowledgement, um, sort of formally acknowledging that this happened um, and, and kind of trying to give some context uh, to it or awareness of it. Um, they pointed out or they highlighted kind of this approach from South Dakota State University, um, which seems to be leading the path in terms of doing more than just acknowledging. So they still receive um, revenue basically from the lands that they still hold uh, that were granted by this moral act. Um, and so they actually use that money now to provide um, like scholarships and other kinds of funding for um, Native peoples. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, as far as I know, Penn State isn't doing anything like that, but at least we, should, <laughs> we can talk about it. <laughs> So that was all I had. And so now we're going to turn it over to Victoria to do our first highlight. All right. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to say thank you for doing this event not in November. Um, I'm actually not a huge fan of, you know, Native American History Month, because if that's the only month that we're talking about American Indians, you know, that's kind of problematic to me. So I do think that should be spread out throughout the year and not only in one month. So good job. Um, and uh, thanks for inviting me in. I, I feel like an honorary MAPSI member today to be able to um, be part of this program. So um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer um, as a Native American scientist and also the author of the book that was this year's EMS Reads Selection, um, which is Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. Uh, many of you may have seen her talk in October. Um, let me see, I can probably also turn on my camera if I forgot to do that, sorry. So many of you may have um, seen her talk in October and thank you if you were able to come to that. If you weren't able to come to that, um, the recording of it is on the EMS Reads website. The easiest way to find that is go to the EMS website and then just top, type in EMS Reads. Um, but it's also embedded within my office area's website as well. So Dr. Kimmerer is a mother, a scientist, a writer, and distinguished professor at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. And she is the founding director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. Um, she is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and a student of the Plant Nations. Um, and through that Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, and she talked a little bit about that in her talk, um, what she seeks to do there is to find a balance of being able to incorporate both indigenous ways of knowing and scientific ways of knowing um, and how those fit together. So similar to what Libby just talked about um, with the Three Sisters um, method of planting. So she also holds, she holds a BS in botany from the same SUNY um, Environmental Science and Forestry School, um, an MS and PhD in botany from the University of Wisconsin. And she's the author of numerous scientific papers on plant ecology, bryophyte ecology, traditional knowledge and restoration ecology. As a writer and as a scientist, her interests include not only restoration of ecological communities, but restoration of our relationships to land. And that's a central focus throughout breeding, braiding sweetgrass as well. Her first book was Gathering Moss, A Natural and Cultural History of Mosses. And it was awarded the John Burroughs Medal for Outstanding Nature Writing, which is a major honor. She has won numerous awards, including the Midwest Book Award, the Sigurd F. Olson Nature Writing Award, and Braiding Sweetgrass is a New York Times bestseller. Robin was recently announced as one of the 2022 MacArthur Fellows. So that's the Genius Grant. Um, and that recognizes her insight and impact um, and brings broader attention to her work and helps make sure that her work can continue so she can continue to inspire 
um, us and um, help us to think better about environmental stewardship informed by traditional ecological knowledge. So as someone who is both indigenous and a scientist, uh, Dr. Kimmerer embodies what it means when we talk about bringing our whole self to work. Um, and in DE&I work, we talk a lot about being able to bring our whole self to work, um, not having to mask part or deny part of who we are to be able to fit in within our, our work environment. Um, and so this really is a great example of how much one can achieve when one is allowed to be oneself, one's whole self um, in the work environment. So with our EMS Reads program, let me see if I can get this to advance. Uh, Braiding Sweetgrass um, was our, our book. And I like this quote from the preface of the book. You know, will you hold the end of the bundle while I braid? Hands joined by grass, we can bend our heads together and make a braid to honor the earth. And then I'll hold it for you while you braid too. So she's inviting us to not only read the book, but to think about it and incorporate um, what we're learning there. And that's what we've been trying to continue to work with in our EMS Reads program. So one of those things is the honorable harvest. And if you heard her talk or read the book, you'll, you'll find that in there. But here are the tenets of the honorable harvest. Um, and it's really mind blowing in a way or, or life changing. It's been described as uh, Tim White, our sustainability officer, it describes this as li a life changing read. Um, <clears throat> But the idea behind the honorable harvest is an idea of respect and gratitude and reciprocity, as opposed to, especially as scientists, we tend to have more of an orientation of um, just expectation, you know, that stuff is there for us, entitlement, um, if you will. But if we switch that to respect, gratitude, and reciprocity, then we can think about what is that relationship between people, us, and the land and what is our role in that and what are the positives to that, you know, as well as the negatives to that. Um, and how can we come to this with a, a sense of respect, gratitude and reciprocity and how does that change, you know, who we are and how we are in the world and that can be personally or, or at work. So <clears throat> I really encourage you to think about these tenets of the honorable harvest. Um, and how you can incorporate them into your life and work, you know, and those are number one, knowing the ways of the ones who take care of you so that you may take care of them as well. Introduce yourself, be accountable as the one who comes asking for life. Ask permission before taking and abide by the answer. Sometimes the answer is no. Never take the first, never take the last. Take only what you need. Take only that which is given. Never take more than half, always leave some for others. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Use it respectfully and never waste what you have taken. Share, give thanks for what you have been given. Give a gift in reciprocity for what you have taken. Sustain the ones who sustain you and the earth will last forever. So when we think from a sustainability point of view, you know, that idea of um, reciprocity, you know, it's not only what can we take from the earth, but also <clears throat> what can we give back, you know, that helps to restore that relationship. So that's what I have on Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, you know, remember that the, her talk and more information is on my office's website or just search EMS Reads. If you haven't yet read the book, um, the ebook e is available um, free through university libraries um, and copies, hard copies are still available uh, from the EMS Library Information Desk. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, really a great pleasure and privilege to be presenting uh, about a physicist with three names. His name is Fred Begay, uh, Fred Young, and Clever Fox. And uh, so you can see he was born in 1932 and uh, he passed away in 2013. Um, I, I'm not sure if I could pronounce the clan names properly, but uh, let me try. Tache Ni, meaning red running into the water people, and Kin Liche Ni, which is red house people. Um, and he was born in Colorado um, uh, to Navajo parents. They were 
uh, Navajo and Ute tribes. Uh, the, his parents were both healers. And um, he is uh, the first physics PhD uh, uh, with, uh, with Native American heritage uh, in, the, in the United States. So that's, uh, uh, so let's see uh, what his background is and, um, um, and how he came about to become a, becoming a physicist. So this is uh, where, you know, the, here it's a zoom in, there's the four, uh, four, four corners, uh, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona. And right there in that red spot in the middle, um, you can see is where the Navajo uh, uh, nation is, Navajo territory is, and um, the uh, Ute, Ute, um, uh, the Ute reservation is. And there's a, a, a zoom in on the right hand side, and and the, this is the re region where uh, Fred uh, Begay was born. And like I mentioned before, his parents were healers. He grew up speaking his indigenous languages. Uh, and uh, he was a very, very curious child. And he uh, uh, wanted to know how things worked. For example, he was very curious about rainbows. He wanted to know how rainbows were formed. And the medicine man couldn't really, he wasn't satisfied with medicine man's explanations. Um, but until age of 10, he didn't speak English, after which they used to take him to town or city sometime, and he would, he was very impressed with, uh, uh, with the with what he saw there. But he also saw people were wasting a lot of food, whereas these he was he realized you know that they were starving often and they were scrambling for food. Um, so that sort of made an impression on him. But by age ten, his parents enrolled him in this missionary school. Uh, called Bureau of Indian Affairs because they offered free food. Um, and they, the school changed his name to Fred Young. That's how he got his second name. Um, but it was less a school and more an army camp. And lots of things, uh, if you uh, follow his biography and many of the films and so on. So they strictly forbade him from speaking any of his native languages or dressing or behaving in any, any such way. They were punished if they did that. The only time they could act as uh, Native Indians was during Christmas or some, some sort of events where they could act like one, but not be one. Um, and as a result, he sort of, uh, the you know, his childhood knowledge of the languages was erased. He also lost touch with his family, which is sort of a sad thing. Um, when he graduated, and he never really graduated because they also picked whatever it is they thought was appropriate for the child. And uh, they never taught him to read or write or English. He never learned English, even at 18. Um, and uh, he, they just taught him farming for eight years. And after that, the only job he could get was enroll in the military. He had to go fight in the Korean War. Um, he came back in 1955. He met Helen Smith in the meantime. They had seven children. He was going to grow, go back and to his parents' uh, uh, farm and do farming, do all this wonderful uh, uh, harvesting that we just uh, learned about. Um, and the tribal council came upon a little bit of money in that time, and they were sponsoring some of the, the, the children to go to university. And they decided, although he was older, they picked him also. He went to University of New Mexico. He opened a book on optics to figure out how rainbows work. And he's like, ah, oh, that's how it works. So he switched his major to physics. So he kept his passion for that rainbow. Um, and so he, he uh, finished, uh, he did a master's and then a PhD in nuclear physics. Um, and he was the first physics PhD from um, any um, Native American um, heritage or Native American tribe. Um, so he, after, after which, you know, Los Alamos, I worked at Los Alamos 
New Mexico is gorgeous. It's called the land of rainbows. You can see some of the uh, images down, down here. Um, and also that Colorado, New Mexico border is just incredible. Um, and so he, he started working at Los Alamos. He was working on fusion, which by the way, is a, is a big area of research today. He was one of the pioneers uh, because that's a source, source of endless energy. Um, and he also was working on gamma rays and neutrinos. As you know, neutrinos are very hard to detect and they are one of those particles that are, they really go to the fundamental nature of what the fabric of the universe is. And so he was asking those questions very early on. Um, but then he would also go back to his tribe. He would take a lot of breaks, go back often. Even during grad school, he was doing that. And it was always two different worlds. You know, the philosophies are so different. And he uh, was always torn between these two. On the one hand, he really loved physics and he really loved the scientific methods of inquiry in the modern world for all the, the, the advances that satisfied him intellectually. But emotionally, he was always connected back to his tribe. And when he went there, they, he, he always felt this disconnect. Even while working at Los Alamos, when he went back, he would try to explain what he was doing. Uh, but by now, he had forgotten his uh, Navajo language. He needed translators. And there was always this disconnect. And they, they could not appreciate why he was doing this. And, why would anybody want to make a nuclear bomb? <laughs> you know, if you have all this knowledge, you know, it didn't make sense to them. They were, the, so the, the, there is a disconnect in the philosophy between the, 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 the native Indian way of looking at the, the, the world and, and ours. Um, so he, he tried bridging that in his lifetime with some limited success. Uh, as, but there's still a long way to go, go, as you can see from these numbers I pulled out. Some of these are a bit outdated, somewhere from 2008, 6, 8, and some of these from as recent as 2016. But order of magnitude numbers are correct. Less than 1% of all bachelor degrees in the United States every year go to, to Native Indians. Of that in physics, it's e even like 0.2% of that 1%. Okay, so it's, it's very small. Um, only 0.26% of all PhDs are awarded to Native Americans. There have been only 44 PhDs in physics in 30 years. You know, he was the first and there, were, there, are, there have been 43 more. Um, so uh, there have been a lot of uh, awards that he has won. You can read them uh, uh, down there in the blueprint. Um, and the number of movies and films uh, have been made, journal articles, uh, National Geographic, NOVA was a program that uh, highlighted him. Uh, there are books, as you can see, in social studies books in schools that uh, you know, profile him. But again, there was there's again this cultural thing that he struggled with all his life. All of these films and journals, he felt like he needed to represent his culture. But at the same time, when they came and they were filming him, he was very uncomfortable. Often he would disappear. He'd go back to his tribe. Then after some time, he might come back and he would continue. Uh, because there was this, this sense that you shouldn't be too self-absorbed and be bragging about yourself. You should think about the accomplishment of everybody. And accomplishments are by a group, not by individuals. And B, tend to be very individualistic. He won this award, he did that, he did this, and so on and so forth. He was very uncomfortable with that, but at the same time, he knew he had to do this as, as one of the role, role models. So, um, so that's, that's my story of Fred Begay. Uh, uh, and, and we have a long way to go, but he was a pioneer and we have to continue his work. Thanks, Venkat. <laughs> Hi, I'm Enrique Gomez. Um, I'm next, and I'll be talking about Kripsol Sosti, who's a geneticist and bioethicist at Arizona State University. She's an assistant professor in the School of Life Sciences. So she did her bachelor's in microbiology at Arizona State, and actually got a couple of masters in bioethics and public health and genealogy. 
She did a PhD at Vanderbilt uh, in genomics and health disparities through the interdisciplinary program. And then uh, came back to Arizona State as a post presidential postdoctoral fellow, where she was then hired after that as an assistant professor. Um, she's Bine from uh, the Navajo Nation. Um, but despite being an assistant professor and just really getting started in her career, she's already published in many high profile journals science, nature genetics, nature communications, nature review genetics, nature science, as common areas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's because she's really a leader in, in many of the areas that, that she works on. So we go to the next slide. So she is a leader in particular in, in trying to rethink how we approach data science and how that intersects with indigenous communities. For example, she's a leader in the care principle. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a little bit. But just to give you a little bit of background, um, it's been documented now for some time that in general, uh, indigenous data, and for example, genetic data, um, has been exploited in many cases without their consent. The Human Genome Project in particular, for example, has been cited as a, a particular project that was really, um, essentially did not quite achieve informed consent. Uh, and in some cases, um, and, and certainly bypassed tribal communities and leadership while generating their data. Uh, and, and in general, has been cited as basically having significant ethical problems in terms of how the data was collected, in particular how it relates to indigenous peoples, um, despite the fact that the, the project itself actually emphasized that they wanted to actually um, get data from indigenous groups, because in some cases they were more isolated than, for example, other populations. Okay. There's actually Arizona State in cells has actually gotten um, into a lot of trouble about, again, informed consent and individual uh, um, uh, essentially misrepresenting what the studies are about, saying that it's about this disease or something like that, where the researchers that go on and use the genetic data for other purposes, right? In some cases, even generating intellectual property, making money off of it essentially um, without necessarily ever even telling the people that that was the intent to use the data for. And again, that's that's just a standard ethic violation, regardless of your kind of code of how you use it. Um, and so, for example, one of the things that, that, that people point out is that kind of the way in which we handle the ethics for, for biological studies is typically to go to the individual, right? Um, but when you have small populations, which can have some somewhat similar genetic uh, makeup, um, uh, for example, a, a tribe with a small number of members, having an individual consent from somebody from their tribe affects the whole group. Because in some cases it can, it can go back and um, be correlated to the specific groups and, and so on and so on. So there's lots of privacy and ethical problems associated with that. And um, such that, um, and so in many of these cases, for example, in these problems, it was really not practice or not even maybe even thought of to try to approach tribal councils and tribal leaderships to respect their autonomy when asking them. Uh, because of that, it has led to a lot of problems with actually with indigenous genetic data in the sense that, uh, rightfully so, many indigenous groups have basically committed to essentially not participating in this. For example, for many years, I think 15 years, Navajo Nation essentially had just an outright statement that it did not approve, that they would not participate in any genetic studies. Nowadays, people will cite it's like, well, we're using genetic data to be able to help essentially um, generate new medicines and so on. So the fact that we're missing this data is problematic. But of course, then, then you get into um, this issue. It's like, well, if you're not necessarily generating the data ethically, then of course it's, it's a problem. And actually, Sosi has been really uh, a pioneer in many of these areas, which is why she's so widely published and cited, uh, because she has been pointing out, for example, that in many cases, when, when pursuing um, uh, data, simply to be fair, right, that's fundable, accessible, and reasonable, which to be honest is basically our standard of excellence when it comes to data, at least mine, right? Um, it's not enough. You have to include other concepts, for example, such as care, collective benefit, who has the authority to control that data, responsibility, and how are you thinking ethically about that data, right? And so she's actually put together frameworks, you know, uh, for enhancing uh, genomic research and, and, and for able to interface with uh, indigenous communities to be able to further science as well as to, to further indigenous autonomy. Right, and for example, these this this diagram that I pulled from our paper, I thought it was actually pretty insightful. Talk about how you know you have these scopes of respect, equity, uh, benefits. You know who does it benefit? Another was asking this question. And we're, 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 I can't say that word reciprocity, 
right? For example, once you collect the data, what do you do with it? Do you ever go back and actually inform your findings to the communities and so on, right? Well, at the same time, building capacity so that people can understand the data that you're trying to collect and how you're trying to collect it, uh, disseminate it in, a, in, a, in an equal way. In some cases, for example, to respect the fact that you need to um, protect privacy, right? Um, and, and that requires things like cultural competency as well as transparency, right? Because you can't, if you don't understand the communities, you don't have enough competence about their culture, then it's very difficult to make these partnerships work, right? And so, so the key becomes when you think about research, who had, who is, who is regulating the research? Who is the community you're trying to serve? And and how do you um, really define sovereignty and control of the data and so on? And so I am, you know. Yes, Crystal it is still getting started in her career. She, I'm very excited to see what she continues to do. She's already made a huge impact in the field of particular bioethics and genetics and how we think about data. And I'm sure that uh, we'll see more great things from her. Thanks. Thanks, Drew. Okay, so uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nathan Smith, and I will be talking about an archaeologist who has a personal interest in. Uh, ancient history, and I just wanted to mix things up a little bit. Unless scientists, maybe you don't think about what it was. Um, so Bertha, Bertha Parker Powell Cody, very uh, storied name and a storied life, was born in 1907 in New York State to an actress and an archaeologist. Uh, she grew up in New York and uh, out in Los Angeles, performing in uh, Barnum and Bailey and Ringling Circus's sort of Pocahontas show in her teenage years. Which, based on the phrase circus in 1907, I'm going to guess probably was the most culturally respectable event. Um, anyway, she married and had a daughter, uh, was divorced, and then moved to Nevada to work on an archaeological site with her uncle, which is where she really started to discover for her uh, love for the science and the um, you know thrill of working on big sites and such. Uh, she was married again to a paleontologist on the site who sadly died the next year of a heart attack in uh, Gypsum Cave, which was one of the sites that she was working at. Next slide is fine. So a lot of her primary accomplishments were related to uh, discoveries on these dig sites, as well as a few of her practices and a lot of the papers that she published. Um, so she participated in excavations at the Mesa House and other Nevada locales. Uh, she also performed a solo excavation in the Pueblo site at Scorpion Hill. And uh, one of her largest sort of finds was exploring some of the most inaccessible crevices in Gypsum Cave, which led to the discovery of a skull example pictured there of uh, an extinct species, species of a giant ground sloth, which undoubtedly required a lot of bravery. I understood a good bit about caving and going in around anything that's considered inaccessible in an already you know, rough dig site cave sounds absolutely horrifying to me. So um, a lot of a lot of bravery and exploration involved there, uh, quite impressive in general. Uh, she also discovered tools in Gypsum Cave indicating one of the earliest sites of human occupation in North America, uh, which is quite interesting to see the exact history of how long and where in North America sites were occupied by human, humans or, uh, you know, different essentially species of human going back. Um, is quite contentious and interesting in that particular community. So it's also a very big discovery. Uh, she discovered a site on her own at Corn Creek due to a protruding uh, camel bone fossil that she noted, uh, which sort of created the entire data set, which is pretty impressive as well. And um, she sort of closed out some of her career by working at the Southwest Museum, publishing many papers, about 21 different articles. And one of the key things that she was known for around that was that a lot of for the more ethnological uh, perspective that she did, she would often include the people she was interviewing and writing these papers based off of as authors, uh, which was not common practice at the time, which is somewhat unfortunate given the contributions that these people made. So it's a very good uh, practice that she worked with that and uh, is very fair and appropriate to the people whose stories she was using. So uh, in her late life, she married again uh, to an Italian-American actor named uh, Iron Eyes Cody. Uh, sadly, a lot of tragedy in her life given uh, some of the deaths she witnessed, but her daughter was killed via an accidental gunshot at age 17. Uh, she later adopted two sons with uh, Iron Eyes Cody. Uh, as far as her legacy goes, she was generally credited as the first Native American female archeologist, which is a big honor. 
Uh, she never had a university education, but she consistently garnered the respect and adoration of her peers due to her high level of skill in the field and also her acute understanding of the subjects she was working with from both the archaeological and ethnological perspective. Uh, she passed away in 1978, though sadly her gravestone uh, erases her essentially entirely by only referring to her by her husband's name, which is a pretty grave insult, in my opinion. So. That is the life and legacy of Bertha Parker Allen Cody. Thanks. Sam. So that's all of our programming. So thanks everyone for attending.